Well, today we are going to start the week, kick off an, a week of exploring and discovering and researching Giannis Xenakis. Xenakis. Starting with his early life, he um, is Greek, um, but his parents were in Romania when he was born. So he was actually born in Romania. So he's Romanian. And, um, he, yeah, he's kind of a lot of nationalities. <laughs> he's got a Greek last name. And he speaks a lot of languages as well. But he is very, very Greek. Um, <laughs> his family is, you know, completely Greek. But they, for some reason, and I'd have to look more into that, why he was born in Romania and why he was there in 1922. So, again, like a lot of the people that we've been studying, born in the 20s, came of age during World War II. But what's really unique about him is, you know, there's a lot of parallels to Stockhausen throughout his whole life story, but his mother died when he was five, and it was very traumatic for him, and he mm. says that he never really overcame that because what it did to his life is, at age five, his father moved him back to Greece, someplace he had never been. He was raised by governesses and going to boarding schools. And he actually was in college when the Nazis were occupying Greece, and he was part of the protests. He was in, you know, the anti-fascist movement, um, also the pro-communist movement. So he was extremely political, but I think it had a lot to do with survival. He was, you know, in, involved in the actual violence that was going on and, you know, saw a lot of his friends die. And, you know... What was Greece's involvement with uh, in World War II. Well, actually, I'm sorry, the, the Nazis invaded, but it was actually the Italians. The Italians invaded Greece um, and were attempting to take it over. Gotcha. As part of the expansion of the empire. I guess I just hadn't really heard, you know... Yeah, you don't hear a lot about Greece's fight during World War II. And for, you know, okay, we're, we're, we're studying somebody who came up during this time, but they're from Greece. So you don't think that maybe like this was going to have as much of an impact, but it was probably more so than anyone else we've talked about. Yeah. I know um, Delia Derbyshire talked about her experiences as a young child, hearing the air raids sirens and how much that infected her and being taken away from her home and her family during the war. But he was an adult. He was in college. And so he was you know, fighting. He, he said he was always on the front lines because he was young and he was a college student. So he has, if you've ever seen a picture of him, he uh, was actually hit by, it was actually the British who came. Actually, the, the Greeks drove the Italians and the Nazis out of Greece. And then the British moved in to try to uh, reinstitute monarchy in Greece. And he fought against them as well. And it was fighting the British that he was hit um, with shrapnel in his face and disfigured. And apparently his friends left him for dead. So he wasn't in the military. No, he was, he was just part fighting. Of, like he, he was, was part of these extremist groups. Street considered fighting? extremist groups. Protesting, maybe? Yeah, in, okay. In the anti fascist movement. So gotcha. he was sort of, I guess, you know, his own little faction of. Protest. I, there is a name, and I will I will look that up. Of he was specific, participating like, sort of in militia group that he was resistance. part of. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. In sort of his own like unofficial. It was like a resistance way. army. Gotcha. Because. Because um, I'm just like, wait, he he wasn't suited up, right? Like, no, no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his friends left him for dead because he looked so disfigured that they thought there was no way he would survive, and I guess they were trying to survive. Apparently his father found him, which I found really interesting. What was his father doing? How did he know where he was? Yeah. His father found him, and he actually was able to survive. Oh, Maybe he knew like, that he was going to be there that day, how and much, when he well, found out what was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, or they, yeah that's, that makes sense. His friends probably ran to yeah. his dad. So, I mean, already he's lost his mother. He's moved to a new country. He's fighting the Nazis. He's fighting the British. He's left for dead. He's overcoming being disfigured. And then he actually has to escape to France because they, because of his political activities, um, they really cracked down once they kicked the British out. They cracked down on all the um, leftist, you know, movements and, you know, communist movements in Greece. And because of him, 
being so outspoken, but apparently he wasn't as much as his friends, but you know, anybody who was, he was sentenced to death. So he fled to France while that was being determined and he snuck into France illegally and he was gonna go to America, but I guess once he got to France, he, he decided liked it. not to leave. Um, so Makes sense he that was never allowed to go back to Greece. It would vibe with his architectural, artistic side. So while all of this is going on, while he's like, you know, fighting and protesting and almost dying, he also got his degree in civil engineering in Athens. <laughs> How was he doing all of this? Um, he was Yeah, you could do online schooling then. <laughs> he was truly a mathematical genius, um, and he was really just a lover of music. Apparently his mom introduced him to music at a young age. Obviously, she died when he was five. Uh, and he just was really, you know an avid listener of music, probably more than just like your average person. Yeah. Um, and then when he was in these boarding schools, he had to be in the boys choir. So he got exposed to the, you know, the classical greats. And um, apparently Bach had a big impression on him, which makes sense because his music is very mathematical. Well, so, he could hear the, the patterns like early on, right? Like he was kind of noticing that like right off the yeah. bat, that was his whole entry point into you know, being sort of obsessed with music. Yeah, he had such a mathematical mind, he could hear the math in the music, and that was, you know, the connection for him. But also, you know, he was an engineer and an architect. So all of these things connected for him, and I think it has a lot to do with his Greek heritage and um, his study of Greek philosophy. And, you know, a lot of, you know, these people like Plato, they were multi multidisciplinarians, you know? Uh, so I think that for be. him, these things were not separate. He wasn't just one thing. He wasn't just into math, and so he was an engineer. You know, he saw the way that math existed in nature, and how music existed in nature, and how all of these things were connected. It's very cosmic, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, when he was in these protests in college, protesting the, you know, the Nazis and the fascists, um, he would be in these crowds of students and protesters and they would be chanting things and he would be hearing that as like a rhythm that was predictable. And then he would say after a while you would start to hear the chaos because people would get out of rhythm and people would start shouting other things and other you know, rhythms would start happening and then maybe there was gunfire. And all these sounds together, if you listen to them as a whole, created a different sort of what he was calling randomness, um, like timbre. So I, when I was hearing him talk about that, it felt like the way he was talking about it was very influential in his then, you know, at, when he went on to study music and, right. and composition, that these things that he experienced left such a mark on him. And I, of course they would. You know, what he went through was extremely traumatic and yeah, intense I mean, you, and that, life and death. He can't get away with that not affecting. And it drove <laughs> him to, like, see the world as a place that he wanted to make art and make more beautiful. And, man, just what that forges in a person to overcome those things yeah, and I mean, survive. It seems to me, too, that the one thing that a lot of these folks have in common, you know, like... Uh, Pierre Schaefer, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can't really teach that level of um, being in tune mm. to your environment, yeah. whatever that's called, as a overall the, characteristic. Yeah, the worlds that they grew up in forced them or gave them an opportunity to hear things that be hadn't been heard hyper before sensitive mm -hmm. to your environment. And maybe that has a little bit to do with coming up in a time of war. Like you were literally I mean, it's a, it's worried. It's the most common thing that we have with about, everyone. About, you know, having to flee a place that you're in. Maybe you're just eating or, mm -hmm. you know, having a conversation with friends and all of a sudden it becomes a literal war zone. So your senses are already so heightened. Are heightened, that makes right. Sense. And I have a feeling that there's some you know, something to that in terms of, you know, 
a lot of these electronic music pioneers, mm -hmm. like you had to be so in tune. And they basically took that and um, allowed it to inform uh, their artistic decisions later in life. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with, um, you know, if you're in tune and you're hearing things that sound like music and rhythm and timbre, that isn't in the traditional, what was mostly classical music at the time, and most of these people were studying classical music. Um, you're going to bring something new to it because you have those experiences and that viewpoint. You can't really separate that. Right. I mean, it might be a good segue to talk about who he ended up studying with mm -hmm. later in his career, but that that person also you know, instilled that same set of values in Stockhausen. Yeah. Um, he So when he fled to Paris, that's really where he stayed for most of his adult life and where he did most of his work. He was able, again, one of these like Forrest Gump things, he was able to get work as an architect with the top leading architect of the time in Paris. You know, like how does this, how is that real? I yeah, don't know what I, he was I doing. Said you, yeah, the time when you could kind of like just elbow your way in I'm really good at math, okay, you know. He must have been, I mean, he started as like a pretty low level person. And um, he might have just worked his way up because people realized he, he was brilliant. He had a lot to share and so he, he was able to prove himself. But um, his most famous work is the Phillips Pavilion at Expo 58, which was in Brussels. Um, and this is probably one of the coolest buildings I have seen. Expo 58. Expo 58. So super I'm cool grab. event. Um, I believe that he designed it to um, because there was a piece of music that was going to be performed oh, in yeah. it. Oh, yeah. So um, he wrote um, what I believe is his first electroacoustic music concrete piece um, that was played as you entered and exit, exited the Phillips Pavilion. But it was really built for Edgar Brazy's um, poem Electronique to be played. So once you entered the building, that's what you experienced. Um, and obviously, all the ties to Pierre Schaeffer, because they were all working in um, his studio and collaborating and using the equipment. So, so simultaneously, he is an architect um, with La Corbusier. That was this person's name, this architect. Maybe you've heard of him. Um, and he's studying with Olivier Messiaen, who also taught Stockhausen and others. But um, when I listen to Xenox's music and I listen to Stockhausen, I hear so much of like these similar... Yeah. A lot of similarities. Energy, I would say. Mm. Um, Xenakis has... A much more harsh um, kind of like tenseness to his music whereas Stockhausen sometimes can get more you know musical and I can have it on in the background a little more depends on what the piece is right. but with Stenox's music like much of Pierre Schaefer's it's very like mechanical sounds um, and you can't really do anything else it calls your attention there's, you know, there's, there's no reading a book while listening to Xenox's music. Maybe you could go on a walk. <laughs> um, but really, it grabs every sense that you have in your body. <laughs> That's really interesting to me. Like, whatever it is that, you know, is the difference there between, like, being able to do something while something else is on versus it mm -hmm. completely captivating you and your attention, you know, like, what's, well, I'm not what's in there? a brain scientist, but my personal experience with certain types of ambient music is that I feel like it speaks to the back of my mind mm -hmm. and sort of like maybe a subconscious layer of my mind mm -hmm. um, where I can have it on and it's like I'm listening, but I'm listening with a different part of myself. Right. And even, I would say, like, pop and rock music, I can kind of go in and out of listening to it because there's familiar structures and rhythms that, like, maybe a different part of me is experiencing. 
Um, and then I might come in and like, you know, hear a certain horn part or an interesting electronic sound or a melody that I grab onto and I want to pay attention to, and then I can kind of go back. But with music concrete, with specifically Xenox's music, it is the front of your mind. It is your present self. It is your body. You are experiencing it. And if you turn any of that off and try to do something else, you really don't hear it in the same way. Mm. That's just my street brain science you know, take on right. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And I, I agree, you know, that that seems to take place with, you know, that, that defines, I would say, ambient music is that, you know. It's supposed to be like a, a piece of furniture in the room. Yeah, it does not specifically call your attention. It, it's ambiance. It mm -hmm. blends in with whatever, you know, environment you're listening to it. In. It can enhance your experience of the environment you're in. Yeah. But I wonder if context has anything to do with that. Like, you know, but like you're saying, it's almost like, you know, you're listening to Xenakis and it, and it pulls your attention. It kind of forces you to stop doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and listen in. It wants you to stand in the middle of the Phillips Pavilion and just listen. Right. Nothing else. Versus, you know, another piece comes on, ambient genre, different artist, all of a sudden, you know, you get back into what you're doing. Like, that's the thing that yeah. I'm interested in, is like, what is the hidden, what's the, what's the secret sauce there? I think it has to do with um, the level of randomness in his music, there's not a uh, repetition. This is similar to Stock hasn't talked about this. He thought most popular music had too much repetition. Um, so your brain can't really get into a rhythm. Like most ambient music is like a loop of something over and over and over again, maybe a slight variation, right? It's a soothing experience. <laughs> but this is, it could be every millisecond, it's changing. There's no set rhythm. There's nothing to groove to. So you're kind of like in this state of like shock, <laughs> kind of experiencing it. And um, also the types of timbres. Yeah. They're, well, they're you, grating, they're harsh, right. they're mechanical. He seemed to be much more um, drawn to like metallic mm -hmm. sounds. Um, maybe it's a good time to talk a little bit about how he's considered the grandfather of granular synthesis. Yeah, I mean... That's that's his legacy, and that's what he worked the rest of his life on. We're kind of jumping to that, which is totally fine, because that's that's really the meat and potatoes of what he was working towards. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Well, just that, you know, granular synthesis is, you know, the idea of taking uh, a sound, you know, that exists in the wild, so to speak, and maybe recording it and then chopping it up into very small milliseconds long pieces and then changing the playback speed, uh, which then affects the density, uh, you know, of, of the micro sounds, if you will. And um, Xenakis is, you know, documented as sort of being the godfather of this concept. Um, and what's interesting is that he used sound generators and tape splicing to kind of create this effect. But it's something that is really popular now um, and has become more popularized with the advent of computers and, you know, and digital signal processing and being able to, you know, <laughs> have a device, you know, that's, that's coded to do this process for you automatically um, you know, and it's, I think it's hit a point of saturation almost at this point. Um, in certain circles. In the sound, you know, experimentation world. Definitely not in the mainstream. Right, 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 right. yeah. Absolutely. But it will. Yeah, I could see it. Will it will be applied to other disciplines, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. it, it already is percolating that way, but in a mainstream way, it's going to hit a tipping point. But I guess my point is that I wonder if the granularity of the sound that he was experimenting with, you know, I wonder if that has anything to do with the attention thing. What about the attention thing? 
like it grabbing you know a piece oh 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 absolutely that there's such a granular level of change going on that it forces your brain your brain is saying like this is something to be alarmed of (laughs) and you also you can't really hear the individual sounds you can so, hear so is it that, as right. an, an overarching new sound as you hear everything together. And so maybe the the lack of familiarity. Mm-hmm. Your brain doesn't have anything to grab onto to become familiar. Is with. causing you to mm-hmm. pay attention to it. Like you're yeah. you're almost like constantly trying to figure out is this something that's gonna hurt me, or. I have a feeling I can play this and won't get in trouble for it because it's so obscure. But just an example of granular synthesis. Ooh. So that was a uh, fast and slow granular synthesis. But I do find it interesting that um, he was doing this, he was playing with this as a concept because he was applying his, you know, mathematical equations about probability and using tape machines and equipment to simulate almost an idea that wouldn't be possible until the computing power was where it is today. It strike I think because of the fact like when we we researched him we were trying to to find, you know, where where's the tape involved, you know, like like how how we knew when he is he worked using with Pierre Schaefer, so he made some music concrete pieces. And you can find it here and there, but it's definitely not the focal point. That leads me to believe that he wasn't all that enthused to be working with tape necessarily. Like he he did it because that was what existed at the time yes. to accomplish his goal. Which is in in my mind two specific schools of tape musician. There's those that embraced it it spoke to them they enjoyed it there they like you know there was something about the the oxide that really like you know gelled with them as a person and then there's those that like used it for example uh pauline oliveros yeah she used it because she had to but that wasn't it for her or necessarily like you know, she didn't continue. She did get excited about computers and, she, and the capabilities right. there, whereas some people rejected, you know, computerized anything. Um, so there, are, yeah, there's definitely like two schools there. Eliane Radig. Yes. You know, continued to use tape. She's still using her ARP and tape. <laughs> and tape, you know, because there was something to that that's you know that she gelled with as a person, you know, yeah. versus. Yeah. So it's like a personality thing. Yeah. And then even Daphne Oram um, embraced, you know, these, you know, the idea of the computer. Yeah, that's career. right. She she converted her Aramics idea into something for the computer, um, but wasn't able to fully see that through. So I would say that it's actually a lot more rare to find someone that... That doesn't go towards that. That continued, you know, to use tape mm-hmm. as their main... Um, bread and butter, you know, even past the time of things being possible in digital sound processing. Yeah, and I think it probably had a lot to do with, you know, where are they in the world? What do they have access to? What are they exposed to? What's their life journey? You know, all those factors. So with that, my point is going to be that I think we're in a special time now that I feel like people are really starting to embrace the tape medium Mm-hmm. for all of these characteristics like I get asked all the time like why would you use tape and the reason is because you know or why would you use it when it, it's not practical it doesn't make sense you know there's no real reason you know it doesn't provide any convenience right. um, you know compared to other methods that are available for recording and, and sound processing and things and my answer always has to do with why it you know it's it has this unique property to it you know it has like sort of this magical yeah and it's an and essence and it's sort it's of an and part but of our studio it's, it's not part the of it only it's not the only thing we, thing use. we use we can, right we can 
bridge some things. With so my point is that other. that we're in a sort of a special time that people are choosing to embrace it, even though it's not convenient mm -hmm. for its special properties. Well, there's something about the tactileness, and also I think because we look at screens all day, we're in our computers all day. Right. Um, there's this it's something to get away from all of that, and it's... to use our hands, and to have a more mechanical experience with something and some of the things that you know may have been considered a detractor um you know back in the day like the noise oh yeah signal to noise ratio and you know the fact that every time you play a tape you know you're basically losing degrading. a little bit yeah yeah you're degrading the the recording you know we've sort of flipped that you know uh, completely on its back and, and decided, hey, that's actually what we really like about tape. You know, like those same principles and properties um, are the main reason why we use, you know, tape, I would say. Those are the things that I that I like about it. I would say, though, at the, the height of tape music, they were in commercial settings, they were in universities, they were in, you know, Places where there was a demand, there was a deadline. Um, they obviously didn't have a lot of the conveniences of other aspects that we have now. So I think people who got really frustrated it, with it were those who were being pushed to create something for a certain purpose within a certain deadline at a certain level of quality that maybe they couldn't get or they couldn't get within the time frame. So, you know... Especially if you're working with, so that's one side of it, but if you're also just innovating and you're working with an idea that you have, the process is so slow and kind of risky, right? Like one false move and you've lost all the work that you did. Right. So, you know, because we can back things up, we can, you know, digitize stuff, it's not as risky. Right. So I think that's part of it too, is yeah, the setting they like were working the, in. Yeah, um... You know, that, I think that has a lot to do also with why analog synthesis kind of went out of style, you know, because of the convenience of the computer and mm -hmm. MIDI and everything. Well, was, in like the 80s, 90s? Yeah, 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 like the industry was, you know, sort of being forced to embrace the digital technologies for convenience sake. And all of a sudden, you know, like you could buy a mini, a mini Moog for, you know, like $100. Yeah, <laughs> so crazy. The waves of things coming in and out of style. And now we're full technology. circle. I see people using like Atari Falcon ST computers from like the mid 80s, you know, to do MIDI sequencing because it's just the sequencer and the MIDI port was built into the computer. And it's like, well, why would you do that? Um, it's because it's, it's fun. It's interesting. It's, you know, it's basic. You know, you don't have all these other distractions. You're not going to get IM'd. <laughs> <laughs> on the yeah. same computer that you're using to sequence a song with. You know, so we there's this desire for things to be more simple. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I find that really interesting. Yeah. Um, so he was... Uh, back to Zanakis. Yeah, back to Zanakis. We like to go off on these tangents and then come back to things. But um, the, the thing that I that really grabbed me that I love the most about what he did was this thing called the U-Pick. Oh man, it's so good. So I have this YouTube mini documentary of him talking about it and talk about computers, talk about retro computers that were cutting edge at the time. Um, this was- It seems like one this of those was things like that would still be cutting innovation. edge though. Like it's- I want one. Right. I know they're, I don't even know if they exist anymore. And when they did, they were only in like museums. Or, like, a, a, they would have one in, like, a cultural space where people could come and play with it. And I'm glad we mentioned Daphne Orm because one of the first things yeah. that I thought about when I saw this thing was, like, it's the Oramix device taken to the next level. Yeah, he was able to take it to the next level. He lived till 2001. I think he was still working until, like, 1997. So he was able to live kind of and work in that moment where... We were getting some more access, but it's really, really funny. <laughs> the setup that he had, it's like, you need, oh, I gotta find this uh, image of what it, um, the layout of it. It's like three computers and a separate monitor. And oh, right. Like the- The little diagram. The thing that you draw on is like 
and a magnetophone, Massive. which is a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. Yeah, like it, it's insane. So it's this thing that you you draw the waveforms and like kind of what you want their character to be over time, um, and then I think that gets translated somehow to one of the computers. There's a couple different processes involved, and then that spits out the sound. So it's like an advanced ceramics machine because she was drawing on film and then the machine was creating the sound from the graphic score. Right. Um, it which, seems like a very similar process, just digital. Like but you're, it's like you're drawing so on this. overwrought with how many components are involved to make it happen. But it's a really cool, I think, like front-end user experience. Yeah, it looked like You're just, it. like, drawing on a giant pad of paper. Like, he has, he, you know, children are doing it. Like, you don't need to know anything about music. And that was his whole vibe was he wanted, um, because he didn't formally study music, and the music world, you know, eventually considered him one of the great composers, but he was yeah. very rejected um, because he wasn't a traditional composer. And, you know, at the time, everyone was doing those graphic scores, and he was writing things more traditionally. So I found that really interesting that he ended up inventing something for graphic score. Yeah. I mean... Uh, <laughs> I gotta find this. It's there so were funny. a lot of people that were, you know, composing music at around the same time he was that were completely rejecting everything that he was doing. Um, oh, yeah. They called him, like, you know, they made fun of him, really. Like, he had a hard time, didn't, I mean, we talked, do we kind of brush on the fact that he had a hard time take, having somebody take him on? Oh, no, we didn't. As a student. Um, he studied yeah. with Olivia MSCM, but... It took a he, while to get there. <laughs> he tried to study with like four or five other people and they were like, you're too old. And you don't know anything. You don't know anything about music like, and you're too old to start. You're too old to be a beginner. We would have to do Isn't music theory terrible? foundations with you and we're not going to do yeah, that. Yeah, he should have been studying harmony and, and things like that. And he, um, when Olivier Messiaen took him on, I think it was kind of informal because he told him to just embrace the things that he already knew about math and his Greek culture and to just do whatever he wanted which is very similar and be to his the unique self advice that he gave stockhausen his other student do only what is completely unique to you and your experience and who you are and how you view the world and then make that <laughs> okay i found this screenshot of which i can't share but i'll try to share it later um oh you found it of the layout of the upic and it's like this main terminal and then that goes into some sort of processor and then that goes out to Two different computers. It looks very similar to an 80s MIDI set. And also to a tape machine. Um, and then also out to a, a visual component. So it like basically takes what you draw and puts it into a computer that then is, is the it. visual as well on the computer. But then it also goes to a tape machine that then asks, produces the sound and there's a microphone. It is hilarious, this drawing. It's amazing. So um, I love this because, you know, there's quite a few clips on YouTube of him talking about it and people playing with it, and it's just bizarre. And the sound it makes, of course, you'd be like, well, that's not music. Right. Why are we even bothering with this? But it was all part of his journey to develop algorithmic music and granular synthesis and uh, randomness. He was really, really interested in randomness in music. Yeah, and earlier when we were discovering this about him, I mentioned that, you know, the random module is always, you know, like kind of a very tasteful module and like a modular synthesizer setup. Um, and there's different sort of colors of randomness, you know, much like there are filters and oscillators. And I just, you know, I have a feeling that the people who designed these modules, you know, must have studied, you know, Zanakis' work, you know, because, like, it's like he's sort of, like, the name, the big name in randomness, you know, when you, when you kind of go down this, <laughs> yes. uh, this path of, of learning about, you know, who used it in, in their um, compositional style. Stockhausen was another one, you know, they, mm -hmm. they were similar in that regard. There are a lot of similarities between Zanakis and Stockhausen, I'm realizing now. A lot, and so yeah. it makes sense that they had a, the same mentor. Thank you guys for joining us today. Hope you guys are all 
staying safe and healthy. I know that we've been saying that every time because it's still an ongoing situation that we're part of. It's hard not to talk about it. Um, but we're glad that we can stay connected and um, make sure that you're doing okay.